The first country to ever attack Taiwan with a warship was the U.S. in 1867. And the country that supported Japan in invading Taiwan during the Mudan incident was the United States in 1874. The country that sold weapons to Japan during the First Sino-Japanese War, leading to China's defeat, forcing China to cede Taiwan to Japan, was the U.S. from 1894 to 1895. The country that actively pushes for Japanese containment of China and Taiwanese containment of mainland China is the United States from the 19th century until today. So can we really say that the United States is our friend? I mean, we're being used to serve U.S. imperialist interests. These recent events show us that so-called Taiwan separatism is not true independence, but it further it, it further um, embroils Taiwan into um, serving U.S. imperialist interests. True independence means independence from this sort of hegemonic, unequal relationship where you don't even have dignity as a human being. And I do not think, and I think this sort of independence can only be achieved through peaceful reunification with the rest of China, where we are equal citizens with equal rights, and we actually have our voices heard as equal citizens and not subjects of empire. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talk It Out with me, Li Jingjing. This show aims to show you the voices and the stories that are often being neglected by Western mainstream media. And it feels like we've entered a new phase of the deteriorating China-U.S. relations after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taipei just yesterday. A lot of people outside of China are wondering why China is so angry, why China is so angry about this visit. Because this gesture, this move, basically shows that the United States is no longer interested in sticking to the agreements it signed with China when it re-established the diplomatic relations with China 50 years ago. When the two countries re-established the diplomatic relations, one of the preconditions is that the United States acknowledge there is only one China and Taiwan is part of China and they broke the diplomatic relations with Taiwan. It was written and still being written on U.S. government documents. You can look it up yourself. But having a senior official like Nancy Pelosi visiting Taiwan, which is part of China, is basically violating all the agreements the U.S. government signed with, with China. So what will happen to the relations next after the tensions have been escalated? And uh, why the United States, why the U.S. government are so keen on creating instabilities in this region and what led to the complicated situation between the Chinese mainland and Taiwan Island. So to explain all this, I have two very special guests joining this discussion today. First, I would like to introduce Zhong Xiangyu. Uh, he's a rapper that both lived in Taiwan Island and the United States. So later, he will share with us about what he understands. So Xiangyu, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. And where are you based right now? Right now, I'm on the East Coast in the United States. Very happy to finally have you on the show. Been following your work for quite a while on Twitter. <laughs> and our another guest is Brian Boletic. He has been on this show before. Uh, he is based in Thailand and he's the, he used to be in the U.S. Marine Corps, and now he is a geopolitical analyst based in Thailand. So, Brian, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm, I'm really excited to be uh, here and talking about this topic with you all. So, Brian, I want to ask you first, can you share with us uh, what's your thoughts on this? Why the United States, why Nancy Pelosi is so keen on visiting Taipei? Despite the, the Chinese government has sent multiple warnings, very serious warnings that this is the right line that no one should cross, but still the U.S. government crossed this line with this trip. So why, what's the reason, what's the motivation? Well, a lot of people are saying um, it's Nancy Pelosi, it's the Biden administration, but if you study U.S. foreign policy since the end of World War II, the U.S. containment of China has been a, a constant, no matter who's in the White House and no matter who is in Congress. So Nancy Pelosi is really just the, the latest uh, doing her contribution to this overall policy of circling and containing China. 
Uh, they know exactly what they're doing. They're doing this very deliberately. Um, they have uh, an obsession with stopping all peer and near peer competitors. This is why they have this issue with Russia as well. It's not just China. And so Taiwan is one of these perceived footholds they have within Chinese territory that they can stir up trouble. They had been doing it in Xinjiang and Tibet, uh, Hong Kong, and now uh, Taiwan is the last foothold they have. And so they're gonna try to make use of it as much as possible. There's a window of opportunity for them closing. China is stronger economically and militarily every single year. And the US is in decline. And so two years, three years, five years from now, they will be in a, a, a lesser position to, to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. So they, they feel now or never, I think. We all know like there are a lot of chaos back home, not just for the United States, but also for Nancy Pelosi herself, her family. Also, we hear from the Biden administration, the multiple different because they're saying uh, Nancy Pelosi can make this decision by herself. The Biden administration, Biden as the president can do nothing. Um, do you really buy that? But I personally, I don't buy that. I think they just use that as excuse. But actually, U.S. government, Biden, uh, uh, totally supporting this. Do you agree? I, I agree with you. This has been U.S. foreign policy, no matter, again, no matter who is in the White House, no matter who is in Congress. It was President Joe Biden who reiterated that China will not be allowed to surpass the United States. Uh, this is a completely irrational stance for the United States to have. China has a larger population. They have access to plenty of natural resources. They graduate millions more in, in essential fields like science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. China will surpass the United States. And there's nothing to be ashamed of about that, but this is just the, the mentality the United States has had for decades and the West in general has had for generations. I, I think it's interesting, uh, Nancy Pelosi and her personal problems at home, you would think she would be consumed with them to try to get her life in order. I think it's a good analogy for the United States overall. They have so many problems back at home and these problems are compounded by American adventurism abroad and, and the pursuit of hegemony. All of this money is being invested in, in everything, uh, antagonizing China, uh, trying to subvert China's neighbors, doing a similar process to Russia and its neighbors, all at the expense of infrastructure, education, everything a nation actually needs to, to prosper back at home. And we can see it, we can see it. The Americans back home can see it. They might not connect it with US foreign policy, but they can surely see it and feel it in, in their day-to-day -day lives. And people around the world can see the, the US declining and they can make the connection with these huge expenditures on, on militarism and uh, just, you know, lighting fires all around the globe. When they fail at home, go abroad, right? It's always someone else's problem. It's always China or Russia causing all these problems for the United States. Chinese are stealing our jobs. <laughs> like, it's, it's hilarious. They have no interest in solving all these domestic problems, either in their country or within their house. But they are busy going to other countries' uh, yards to deal with like a, give, providing freedom and democracy for other countries. This is like always hilarious to me. By the way, Xiangyu, do you want to add something? And if you guys want to add something, always feel free to jump in. We can have a, like, a free discussion. Hmm. I think um, Nancy Pelosi's personal reasons aside, you know, she's always been this sort of anti-China hawk. Um, she, another thing that we need to keep in mind is she is the main fundraiser of the Democratic Party and the, um, the midterm elections are coming up and the DPP strategy has been to increase visibility of Taiwan to make the youth feel good about being Taiwanese because quite frankly, ever since Tsai Ing-wen's election in uh, 2016 as the leader of the Taiwan area, there hasn't been much um, successes in areas like the economy. So they've been they've really been pushing the whole um, identity card to make people feel good about it because they have nothing else to rely upon. So this coincides with that policy as well. It, it's it's funny because almost like there were only thirteen countries in the world to recognize Taiwan as as a country, but there are almost two hundred countries in the world 
So like overwhelmingly large number, the inter, basically we can say the international community doesn't recognize Taiwan as a country. They only recognize uh, China and the government in Beijing as the legitimate government of China. But even with that fact, a lot of people still think Taiwan is a sovereign country, which is in no way, like it, it is definitely not. And it's even written in all these documents. I can share some, some on the screen. I just, okay, I just want to show our viewers who are very confused about the situation and who want to criticize us. Why are you saying Taiwan is not a country? Taiwan has always been part of China, recognized by the international community. Uh, this is from the United Nation. So uh, this is the restoration of the lawful rights of, the, of China in the United Nations. So this is what they said. The United Nations recognize the representative of the government of the People's Republic of China are the only lawful representatives of China to the United Nation. And China is also one of the five permanent members of Security Council. They restore all its right to People's Republic of China and recognize the representatives of its government as the only legitimate representatives of China to the United Nation and to expel forthwith the representative of Chiang Kai-shek, Jiang Jieshi, also known in Chinese as Jiang Jieshi, Chiang Kai-shek, from the place where they unlawfully occupied the, uh, the United Nations. So basically, they restored China's uh, position in the United Nations and expelled Chiang Kai-shek from Taiwan. This is recognized by the United Nations. Taiwan doesn't have any representatives in the United Nations. It's not a country. Yeah. I ask people who say that Taiwan is a country to show me when Taiwan has declared independence from China. Point me to a document because, okay, the U United States declared independence from Britain. This isn't like a, this, the, the relationship between them, the United States, the 13 co colonies in England is not exactly the same as um, Taiwan and the mainland. But still, you can point to 1776 as the year that the Declaration of Independence was signed. And you can also point to the year where the 13 colonies won the Revolutionary War and that how that independence became um, a recognized fact by the international community. But where can you find it for ta from Taiwan? You can't find an, a declaration of independence because it never happened. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I, I want to share uh, from the U U.S. State Department's official website uh, right now on their website. If you go there, uh, it it says we do not recognize, uh, we do yeah. not support Taiwan independence. And you know what's interesting, a year ago, it said the US acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is a part of it. And then they erased it. And this shows you who is at the very root of this problem. And again, it's always projection. This is what the United States does. They're saying mm. China is the aggressor. Actually, the United States is the aggressor. They're, they're uh, they're backing away from their bilateral agreement with China, and they're also violating international law at the same time. And this isn't the first time they've done this. They do this everywhere they go. This is what defines U.S. foreign policy. It's what, what makes it so dangerous. And this is the reason why uh, we, we see these tensions. It's projections. The U.S., they flew all the way, halfway around the world to, to Taiwan. It was not China going halfway around the world to bother the United States. It's the other way around. And that, I think more and more people are starting to see through this. I hope. I hope. Yeah. And to prove Brian's point, uh, you can go to the White House website to just look for documents, the relations with China. You can find what the United States government says about how they acknowledge one China. And uh, I also have some documents earlier I uh, shared the United Nations, but I also got the Shanghai communique. Let me... This is the one. So this is the document I downloaded. Uh, so this is the name. If you don't believe us, you can also find it online. It's not hard. Just Google it. So easy. The joint communique between the United States and China in the year 1972. That was Nixon, right? So when when United States trying to establish, uh, resume the diplomatic relations with China. So. I want to go to this paragraph. So basically, this is the two sides like have serious long disputes, blah, 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 blah. And the US said declared, the United States acknowledges that all Chinese 
on either side of the Taiwan Straits maintained there is but one China, and that Taiwan is part of China. This is the United States documents. This is what it say. One China, and Taiwan is part of China. And the United States government does not challenge that position. It reaffirms its interest in the peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. This is what it is said, and this is one of the preconditions that China and the United States can have a diplomatic relations. So the document, as you can see, it's saying that it it wants the cross strait relations to be、um, resolved by the Chinese people on both sides of the straits themselves in a peaceful manner. And what、yeah. the U.S. is doing right now is it's not outright saying we support Taiwan independence, but it is doing everything it can to make the whole peaceful resolution. Kind of impossible at this point. Yeah,、mm. increasingly difficult at the very least. Exactly, and this is the website of the like. This is the chronology of the U.S.-China relations. I mean, such a long span of time, and this is from the U.S. government. So you can find this website yourself. So this this basically listed all the ups and downs, all the relations between China and the United States in the past few hundred years. And then let's go to the year 1978 when the two countries resumed,、uh, normalized the relationship. So it's a long list. Let's go. I think 70, January 1st, 79 was when the relationship resumed. 78 was when it was agreed, right? Yeah. So basically, anyone who go to this website, you can see what exactly happened、um, e- each year gradually. How they start to communicate, how they establish diplomatic relationships. Now, seventies,、uh, the rise of Deng and Carter. And in the year nineteen seventy eight, agreement reached on normalization, right? And、uh, take a look at this paragraph. Again, after months of negotiations, in December, nineteen seventy-eight, the two governments finally issued a joint communique that established full diplomatic relations. By this agreement, the United States recognized the PRC, People's Republic of China, as the sole government of China. And affirmed that Taiwan is part of China. Again, you can find this definition on every U.S. government documents websites. So it's so it's interesting that the public still thinks、uh, Taiwan is a country. But I, I think one of the reasons is like how the media or how the in, politicians、uh, describe Taiwan and China. In their unofficial languages, they say that in official languages they say one thing in official languages, but in reality,、uh, if you take like what、uh, what CNN, AP, or those U.S. mainstream media write about、uh, Chinese mainland and Taiwan, they always describe that like two worlds. So I think the public just got a concept. Oh, they're different. I will give credit to the propaganda skill of the United States. It's really impressive. That, that is exactly what it is. It's the media, and it's amazing how concerted it is. How it doesn't matter which outlet you're looking at, they describe Taiwan in such ambiguous terms that they know the reader is going to walk away with the wrong impression. They will never talk about what's even on the official U.S. State Department's、uh, website now, or these documents that you showed, because you can see from those documents that is the actual agreement, and you can see how watered down and twisted the the U.S. State Department's current statement is on their website, and you and again, it just perfectly illustrates who is the problem here. And you can look at other things too. I think a lot of Americans simply don't know this, but the United States has no embassy in Taiwan, and Taiwan has no embassy in the United States. I mean, if it was a country, there would be embassies. It is not a country. There are no embassies. And if you look at the American Institute in Taiwan, it says、uh, this is how they maintain their. Unofficial relationship with Taiwan. So, if Taiwan was a country, why would you have an unofficial relationship with it? It doesn't make any sense. But again, this is what the U.S. does. They they make deals.、Um, they they take advantage of the good faith of who they're making the deal with. They've done this to Iran, to Russia, to everyone, and then they walk back on the deal. And not only that, they blame the other party 
for the deal falling apart and, and for relations uh, straight, being strained and, uh, you know, conflict uh, entering on the horizon. This is, this is a problem. I mean, first, the United States uh, signed all these agreements with China, acknowledging one China, Taiwan is part of China, but in reality, they are doing something else. And especially with the recent visit from Nancy Pelosi, and even Nancy Pelosi, he, she gave a speech earlier today. And if you listen to her words, um, I forgot the exact quote, but she definitely used the word, well, I'm very happy to be here to build bond between our two countries. When she said two countries, she meant United States and Taiwan. But then she added, uh, well, not changing the one China policy. I mean, do you see the contradictions? How can you recognize Taiwan as, the, uh, as a country and then not break the one China policy? So, I mean, so this is the problem with the U.S. politicians. They are saying one thing officially, signing agreements, uh, sign, saying one thing with different governments, but then doing another thing with their actions. Then how, with this behavior, how can anyone trust you as a government? Because your words, your agreements mean, means nothing. Uh, nobody can. Nobody can trust them. And I think this is why this is a contributing factor to America's waning power worldwide. Uh, uh, nations big and small cannot trust the United States. They, they see this happening. Uh, a lot of nations go along with it because they're fearful of the United States. The, the United States has destroyed entire countries in this fashion. And uh, people are worried about the, the growing tensions. And it, it is fully rooted in this this double game. They're playing a double game. Ned Pelosi is blatantly violating the one China policy by by standing there in Taiwan in violation of Beijing's wishes and, and then saying we are honoring the one China policy. And they know they can get away with it because the, the American public, uh, uh, by and large, is ignorant of these facts. Also, there's this element. Um, I, I mean, people can disagree with me on this, but I think there's a huge a racism element in the United States, in, in U.S. culture, uh, especially against China. And I think they, they're playing on that. And they know that it doesn't matter what we say or if it adds up or not. People have prejudices against China to begin with. And that will help us kind of uh, patch up these inconsistencies with our, you know, with our policies. Oh, Xiang Yu, I, want, I hope you can share with us some of the, some of the things, uh, situations in Taiwan. It's true, there are disputes between Chinese mainland and Taiwan, but I also noticed the opinions in Taiwan are actually very divided. There are separatists, they, want, they are seeking independence, but there are also huge amount of patriots or huge amount of people that actually really support the reunification, support uh, the government in Beijing. So what led to Taiwan got so divided? The various um, contradictions that were brewing in Taiwan, and part of it was also the um, the KMT itself mishandling internal contradictions in um, in Taiwan, and unfortunately, this led to this sort of logic that um, opportunists seized on for their propaganda purposes to say, "Hey, remember those terrible years of repression by Chiang Kai Shek? Now, where did Chiang Kai Shek come from? He came from the Chinese mainland, and." Where is the where is the Communist Party of China from? It's also on the Chinese mainland, and you also and then when um, the KMT had this sort of anti-communist uh, and anti-CPC education, then um, it's really easy to paint them as the bad guy, but also appeal to um, the locals by saying, "Hey, remember all all these terrible things that happened at the hands of the KMT?" Well, basically. The Communist Party is just the red version of all of that repression that Chiang Kai-shek carried out. That's legitimately um, a huge, a huge part of the um, the propaganda that's going on. So, um, and then in the 1990s, I said, um, as I said earlier, there was this sort of um, this marked the beginning of a shift in this sort of identity in order to facilitate the the um, the further liberalization of Taiwan's economy and maintain its status as a U.S. client. And um, yeah, here we are today. Um, there's also the reality. I mean, 
yes, Taiwan is a part of China, but it also has been governed separately from the mainland for 70 years because of these historical reasons and because the P and CPC stands for patience. So it's um mm. but the but the longer but the longer you wait, though, the problem is you have new newer generations of um of um Taiwanese people who just don't feel that sort of emotional attachment to the mainland, especially since um, starting at the turn of the century when the DPP was elected for the first time to um, the leadership of the Taiwan administration. And this was not done in a democratic way, by the way. This was done in a very top-down fashion. They started changing the curriculum. And with as far as history goes, they kind of started gradually teaching mainland Chinese history as like, kind of foreign history and then separated Taiwan history from that. Whereas in the past, like when my parents were growing up, Taiwan history was a subset of, you know, domestic history, domestic history being all of Chinese history. So from a young age, um, these, these, um, this new generation was kind of just estranged from understand getting a full understanding of you know what it means to be chinese what chinese culture is what chinese civilization is while still fundamentally practicing chinese culture but being told in a way that oh you're taiwanese first before you are chinese and you let that go on and on and then you get you let in all these ngos that want to um that want to because you can't just go as an ngo and like as a u.s foreign policy you can't just go in and and like outright say what your intentions are. You have to find justifications. And these things unfortunately become the vessels. These existing problems become vessels for, um, you know, these foreign actors to, and, and domestic um, opportunists to um, inject their policies into as a sort of packaging to sell to the public. Western powers like U.S. government were taking advantage of this uh, situation, historical situation uh, in Taiwan and trying to brainwash the, the, the young generation to like, oh, you're different, you're, you're not Chinese, even though everything you do is really Chinese, speaking Chinese, doing Chinese culture, but you're not Chinese. Yes, that's exactly what the United States is doing through the National Endowment for Democracy and they created the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, which works hand in hand with the NED. And a lot of people say to me when I, when I bring up this topic, well, what do the people in Taiwan want? Why don't you respect what they want? And the problem is, is that really what they want? Or is that what millions of dollars from the US pumped into uh, the environment there? Uh, putting this idea in their head, Ask people have to ask themselves, is this idea serving the best interests of the people living on, on Taiwan? Is it serving their best interests or is it serving Washington's interests at the cost of the people living there in Taiwan? And it's so obvious that it, that that's the case. And uh, Ukraine and Taiwan are not, not comparable. There's so many differences. U Ukraine is a country, Taiwan is not, but the US used the exact same process to irrationally turn people against uh, you know, for Ukraine against Russia, they have so many ties together, and they artificially and irrationally divided divided them. And look at Ukraine today. Look at the the state of everything there. And this is exactly the plan the U.S. has for Taiwan. They do not care about Taiwan. They care about their own interests and advancing them. And they will use Taiwan to do that. And and this is a this is a tragedy. And there's so many people walking into this trap. And the, like the Democratic Progressive Party, surely they know, and they're they're going along with it for their own self interest. So the 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 best interests of the people in Taiwan, I, I clearly see not being served with this this whole new idea, and mm. that's why when you say what do the people in Taiwan want, well, what what do they really know about about the situation and how much has been put into their head by foreign interference. You can have self-determination if these ideas are <laughs> coming from across the ocean, uh, mm. from Washington. Mm. Uh, exactly. It's kind of like I... how a lot of times, um, you know, victims of abuse, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's kind of like how oftentimes you find them victims of abuse, so not acting in their self-interest um, for various, for a variety of reasons. And if you can agree that, um. Grooming can happen on an individual um, basis, you know, like um, you have predatory people 
like taking advantage of oftentimes younger people and kind of brainwashing them into, you know, so they can be taken advantage of. And if you can agree that can happen on an individual level, then you should understand that it can happen on a societal level, especially when you have an empire like the United States with shadowy organizations like the NED and all sorts of other NGOs that go in into these, you know, into other countries and prop up a bunch of these think tanks that influence the policy, uh, influence the public opinion. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what happened in Hong Kong as well. Uh, because like you guys mentioned, all this so-called independent think tanks, uh, NGOs came in, came here uh, saying that we are here for democracy and freedom, but actually they are changing the textbooks in schools and uh, planting ideas in, among the young generations. And then gradually we realized the young generations of Hong Kong didn't know the history of China. And they thought British, who were the colonizers, are actually their savior. They thought, they want, some of them were, were chanting, like we want to go back to the British rule because that's how we had, that's when we had full, real democracy. Well, in reality, British never gave them democracy. So I mean, their thoughts, their understanding about history or everything were totally being polluted by these so-called NGOs and, um, and uh, these think tanks. I remember, I know a young guy from Hong Kong, and he, he became very patriotic. He really supported uh, Beijing. And then I remember he said, when we grew up, we were always told we are special. Our Hong Kong, we Hong Kongers are so special. But then years after years, like, why are we special? How are we special? They just don't know <laughs> what are we special at. Just being taught we are special, we are Hong Kongers, we are different. But then after he came to the other parts of China to study and work and live here, he realized, wow, like we are not that special. Actually, the mainland on so many levels uh, developed so much faster than Hong Kong. But I mean, that's, I mean, that's the, the thing these so-called NGOs and think tanks do to the young generations. And do you think that's, I think, from what you said, Xiang Yu, similar things have happened in Taiwan. Go ahead, Xiang Yu. Uh, it's a very similar things, and you see, um, the DPP is becoming even more um emboldened recently. I mean, you see, you know, the shutdown of the of the news of the news channel uh, CTI Zhongtian. Mm. Yeah, like they got their um broadcasting license revoked, and um. Now, Minshi, like FTV, it's being it's basically controlled by the DPP. And then you see um, the Tsai Ing-wen administration um, forming all sorts of partnerships with, you know, YouTubers like and saw all sorts of Internet influencers to give the appearance that these sorts of ideas are coming from the grassroots. But in reality, these content creators end up being groomed by like the handlers to spread a very specific message. So then you have, um, there are opposition voices, but then they're made out, but then because they're outside of that very huge echo chamber, the, um, their impacts are sort of diminished and people are getting ostracized for, for, um, in many social circles for holding on to different beliefs. And mm -hmm. you also see the passage of things like the Anti-Infiltration Act, which on the surface is just, okay, we don't want, um, we don't want CPC, um, like agents or whatever influencing the um the administration but it was passed so um just it was so rushed just 34 days so ironically the very um the DPP was born from its struggle against um uh, the KMT's former um dictatorship and fought for this sort of the liberal democracy that exists in Taiwan today but that very same liberal democracy that the um that the previous generation of um, DPP people fought for is quickly being eroded away by the current generation of um, DPP leaders. I think that's I think that's ironic that that they're claiming to be a democracy. Uh, they're you know they're violating people's rights. There is no freedom of speech, uh, and they're talking about infiltration by by the CPC when they are completely infiltrated by the United States from all the way across the ocean and a nation with a demonstrated track record 
of be- destroying and burying entire nations. And uh, this is this is what they're doing to China through Taiwan. And it, and and you were mentioning uh, grooming. I think I think that is very accurate. And they're doing it to young people. All of these movements, not just in Taiwan and Hong Kong. But all of these movements here in Thailand, neighboring Myanmar, Malaysia, the whole Milk Tea Alliance, this is a youth movement. They are preying on children and they, they're doing it at younger and younger ages. They, they were in the universities. Now they're in the high schools. U.S. US government funded programs, the uh, YSEALI, the Young Southeast Asia Leadership Initiative. This is the same type of program. They're doing this in, in Taiwan. They're doing this in Southeast Asia. And, and again, it is a... U.S. program serving U.S. interests at the expense of the people participating, and they're trying to form this united front against China, which when you look at the region, China is rising, the region is rising with it, and the United States is sabotaging it, Mm -hmm. all while saying China is the problem and attacking and destroying China is the solution, when in reality, that's just going to subjugate and subordinate the entire region back under U.S. and Western uh, Mm -hmm. modern-day colonialism. I do ask um, my friends in Taiwan how um, they can be supportive of these sorts of things and not and not question U.S. influence in Taiwan, while at the same time being um, opposed to Chiang Kai-shek. I don't know if um, your viewers know this, but nowadays it's some um, these pro-separatist Taiwanese liberals who hate Chiang Kai-shek more than Chinese mainlanders do, because from the Chinese mainland perspective, he was just, he was ultimately a loser and he's been dead for a very long time. There's no reason to really hate him that much. And in the grand scheme of things, he was a Chinese patriot in his own way, I would say. Like, mm. is that that was probably what the popular opinion on the Chinese mainland is, right? He, like, even him doesn't support, like, Taiwan independence. He's like, oh, we are all China. Like, even though he, Chiang Kai-shek doesn't, didn't like uh, the CPC, but he never won a separated China. It's like... So, I mean, but many people don't u- know this fact and they just use like Chiang Kai-shek as the cause of the Taiwan independence. Like- I would say, though, in, an, in a weird way, in an ironic mm-hmm. way, he was he was um, staunchly against Taiwan separatism. But because of um, the way his leadership um, played out, panned out in Taiwan and because of some of its problems, he inadvertently sowed some of the seeds for later the liberal opposition and the independence movement to grow, unfortunately. And also, I want to add something because Brian mentioned how U.S. NGOs, think tanks trying to brainwash uh, regions like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and even like the entire Southeast Asia. You Actually, we did an interview before uh, with Brian Beledic. Uh Brian shared his analysis of how this huge influence, how the United States trying to destabilize entire Southeast Asia just, just to contain China. They don't care about how much destruction, how much death they caught in the region. So like as long as it's for their goals. So, I mean, also, Brian, do you want to briefly introduce, just tell us more about um, how the, U- the United States trying to brainwash spread some dirt through their, how to say, propaganda machines, like social networks in the entire Southeast Asia regions? Yeah, absolutely. You, on the screen, you have the Office of the Historian, which is on the U.S. State Department's official website. And all the way back in, 19, in the 1950s, you can find documents on that website talking about how, you know, the whole point of the Vietnam War was to contain China. And they're doing it along the Korean Japanese front, Southeast Asian front, and the in- Indian front, India. And today, you can still see the United States trying to create uh, a situation on all three of these fronts against China to contain China. I and mean, how are they doing this? If you look at the relationship nations in Southeast Asia have with China, it has, it has been growing. It is constructive. It is mutually beneficial. I'm, I'm here. I've been here my entire adult life. I've seen the positive impact China has had on the region, the rise of China has had on this region. And and so what is the US doing? They're trying to, well, they they build up these youth movements who just uh, are just taught to hate absolutely everything about their own country and also China. 
and to embrace the West and everything about the West. And they also support opposition political parties who are pro-Western. And they'll do exactly to these countries what they did to Ukraine, where they uh, maneuver that into power through, through uh, undermining stability, violence, subversion, even coup, uh, get them into power. And then they will just irrationally cut all of their ties with China. You, 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 Thailand, its largest trade partner is China. Largest investor is China. I, they're building the, the high-speed rail network with China. Uh, so what they want to do is get a political party into power that will just irrationally cut Thailand off from China, create, create belligerence toward China to suit the United States. It will destroy Thailand's economy. It will divide and destroy the Thai people. It'll create ripple effects across across the region, just like Ukraine is doing right now. And it's solely to serve the purpose uh, of the U.S., not not just to contain China, but all of Asia. And they're just doing the exact, I mean, Taiwan is part of China, but they're doing the exact same process. That is how they're trying to use the people there, uh, transform them into a battering ram uh, against their own country. This is what they're doing. And uh, it's, you know, the evidence is everywhere. When people say, Brian, you that's your opinion, that they're fun. You can go to the National Endowment for Democracy's website, pick a country, and they'll have a whole list where they disclose all of the funding for all of these opposition groups. It's it's not a secret. So, so this is what they're doing. And uh, you mentioned the media. They also have all, all sorts of programs to bring people from Southeast Asia to the West, train them in in you know, to report the news the way the West wants, send them back. They're networked in with other Western journalists. They want to stay in that network. They feel special that they were picked. And so they'll continue uh, repeating these narratives, no matter how false they are, no matter how much evidence suggests that it's it's not true. And this is how they, they, they create obedience. They create these networks, uh, this obedience and this influence. And it, it's just corrosive. It's corrosive for the region. And, and this is basically their plan. And this is how empire has, has worked all throughout history. So, um, yeah. I have some thoughts I want to um, bounce from that if, uh, if um, Jingjing has um, comments yeah, first. Sure. No, 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 go, uh, go ahead. Oh, honey. okay. I think um, you were talking about how the U.S. doesn't care about these people. And um, I don't know if um, you've been following this, probably have, I'm talking to the audience, but um, right now the strategy in Taiwan, the military strategy is um, they're starting to hide tanks and like residential garages they're starting to disguise military equipment as construction equipment in residential areas in cities so what does this mean it means that the administration is prepared for in the war situation for it to be for for the civilians to essentially serve as meat shields to um the military and it's a form of psychological warfare to get um the other side to unfortunately have to have to um cause some civilian casualties if should war break out and this is very dangerous because um this does not this does not benefit the people on taiwan it doesn't benefit the cpc does not want to do this and um it's going to wreck the economy but at the same time, like it's also promoting through these sorts of um, NGOs and these sorts of um, these sorts of uh, the propaganda machine. It's telling the youth in Taiwan, hey, we can keep on stepping on the red line and like just poking the tiger in the eye and nothing is going to happen. And um, Big Daddy America is always going to come in and protect us. But um, here, here's the thing. Even if the United States wanted to, and I do not believe that the United States will commit to protecting um, protecting Taiwan should a, a war across the strait um, happen, um, vessels can, U.S. military vessels can get up to a thousand nautical miles away from China before the PLA has the right to attack them. Their missiles can only go 800. You see the problem here. Yeah, and even the top military brass is not is not optimistic about um about first first off Taiwan being able to, the Taiwan administration being able to defend itself should war with the PLA happen, and it's also not very optimistic that the U.S. can do anything about it. 
And these are reports from the RAND Corporation, which is not known to exactly be too, um, you know, pro-China. And at the same time, it's like the DPP, like right now, it has no policy successes. The only thing is just building this sort of um, Taiwan identity to get people there to feel good about being Taiwanese, but not have not have anything to show for it. And um, we talked about the um, the chip situation earlier. By the time, if things continue the way they are, 2024, 2025, there could be a huge recession. And if um, the DPP gets reelected again, I mean, they already did pull the Nancy Pelosi card. It caused the, you know, caused the excitement among, you know, the, the, the activist, the activist youth, everyone, nobody else really cares too much. It's like just another day, but they can't pull the stunt again because it's not, there's only one Nancy Pelosi. It's not going to cause the same level of excitement unless you get the president to go to Taiwan, which I don't know if it's going to happen. So what, what cards do they have left? Well, if the people in Taiwan, if the youth in Taiwan are led to believe that um, the, the, the PA will never, will never use force and that America will always protect them, then in the desperate bid to um, maintain the support of the people, the, the next DPP leader, should he be elected, which would probably be um, Lai Qingde, the current vice leader, might be reckless and be adventurous and push for an independence referendum in 2025 because we can do referendums on every odd year. And that alone could be a catalyst for just disaster across the strait because this is an issue of sovereignty. It's when things like this happen, then Beijing is put in a situation where it's damned if it does something, it's damned if it doesn't. So it's a very bad situation. And I hope... I hope um, people in Taiwan think about this very hard and start thinking about how to build a more peaceful situation, a more prosperous situation, and one that won't lead to the sorts of, the sort of um, destruction in a situation where Chinese people are forced by circumstance to kill Chinese people. I I think that um, just just as you're saying, the the you know China does not want to resolve this through force. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to do this peacefully, uh, and and a lot of people were disappointed that there was no violence. I think overall that if China has the opportunity to do this reunification peacefully, that's that's what they would choose. That is optimal. So they they will choose that over saving face in the short term, peaceful unification in the long term. And, and as you were saying about using the civilian population as human shields, this is exactly what's going on in Ukraine. The United States is not, not helping. They know what is happening. They're encouraging uh, the government in Ukraine to, to literally fight to the very last Ukrainian willing to pick up a gun. This is what they're doing. And this is what they will do to Taiwan. Again, the situations are, are not similar in many respects, but the, the method that the U.S. is using is similar. They don't, they don't care. They're going to come and help Taiwan. And you, you also were talking about investing in the United States, investing in chip production in the U.S. The mainland, China mainland is also doing that. But you see they're, they're, the U.S. is pulling the rug out from under Taiwan. They're, they're, they're already signaling in every possible way that they are using Taiwan that to its own detriment. And uh, there still seems to be people going along with it. It's, it's, it's quite tragic. It is my opinion that the U.S. does not want peaceful reunification, but it also does not mind reunification through force. I feel the U.S., is, it's kind of implying that it supports Taiwan independence to embolden the DPP and its constituents to act more recklessly. But um, in a situation where reunification happens through force, I think the U.S. will like it because... Peaceful reunification means that there is a buildup of peace and mutual understanding. Reunification through force means it's going to be very hard. It's it's easy to to you know capture Taiwan. The hard part is if you do it through force, then how do you stabilize the situation? And if the situation is unstable, then the U.S. can continue to use it. it I, I would argue that. It would be an even more effective way to cause destabilization in the rest of China than than it is now. It would 
it would be even easier. Just look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a part of China, but they were still able to use um, still able to use it as a means to mm. destabilize the rest of China, or in an attempt to destabilize the rest of China. I want to add something because I think for anyone in any part of the world that think the United States going is going there to help and protect people in Taiwan. And to anyone in Taiwan think United States is your friend, think twice and take a look at the world. What, take a look at what happened to those people who United States used to call friend, who United States trying to help. Um, for example, if you look at West Asia, the Latin used to be the, the United States favorite poster boy uh, to the soldier, the hero that fight with the Soviet Union before he became the biggest terrorist. And they went there to help U Ukraine, and now they want to fight until the last Ukrainian. And uh, there's an article I want to share with you, and because, uh, because this basically reveals the true intention. So this is the, um, are you guys seeing this article? Can I see that clearly? Okay. This is the article on the Hill, U.S. media, right? And this article is called "America Must Prepare for War with China Over Taiwan." They're calling for war. They're openly calling for war. Okay. This paragraph: Taiwan is of vital geopolitical importance to the United States. And here. Taiwan is the cork in the bottle for Japan. Whoever controls Taiwan will control Japan and the Republic of Korea's shipping lifeline. Chinese control of Taiwan will give it enormous influence over both Japan and Korea, fundamentally altering the strategic calculus in East Asia and give China its long sought after opportunity to philandes both countries. I mean, they write their intentions <laughs> publicly. They are saying if, if China controls Taiwan, which like Taiwan is part of China in the entire time, but they're saying they worry China if they have full control, have reunifications with Taiwan, China will control Japan and, the, and South Korea. But what they, that means they are trying to do this. They try to control Taiwan. So their allies, South Korea and Japan, can join the United States to contain China. And I think not many people realize how close, how close the Chinese mainland and Taiwan Island is. I think the up across the street is Fujian province. And the city called Pingtan in Fujian province is only 128 kilometers away from Taiwan. Uh, if you draw a straight line, it's so close. If there's a highway over the ocean between um, between Taiwan and Fujian province, it probably only take one hour by car, maybe shorter. Um, so I mean, it's even you can travel faster between these two provinces, even faster than we than traffic in Beijing. So that's how close Taiwan Island is to the Chinese mainland. If I mean, it, it will be super dangerous if the United States and its allies have full control uh, to, to use Taiwan to, to contain China. So, I mean, what's your thought, Brian? Uh, th this, again, this is projection. They're, they're worried about what China will do if it controls Taiwan, which, again, it already does. And the, the Strait of Taiwan already does. Uh, this is all about the, the United States and its desire to control shipping and, and uh, the sea lanes and everything else in the entire region. Uh, who, who is China trading with? I mean, who does Japan and South Korea trade with? Their, their largest trade partner is China. So uh, why would China disrupt sea lanes that its own trade depends on? This is projection. This is what the U.S. wants to do to encircle and contain China. And they've written policy papers about how they will target maritime shipping, uh, how they could close down straits. They've reconfigured the U.S. Marine Corps specifically for this task. They got rid of all of their tanks. They have these long range uh, rocket systems now. They're supposed to uh, jump from one island to the other, be able to temporarily close straits. And, and it's all about stopping 
commerce and who benefits from the commerce, not just China, but also Japan, also South Korea. And uh, just, just as you say, and just look at it, the US has tens of thousands of troops in Japan and South Korea. This is to subordinate both of those nations to US foreign policy objectives. They want to do the same to China. It's about controlling the entire region, not just China. And so it's projection. When you read an article like this, oh, what if, what if China does this or that? Oh, China is threatening tr trade in the region. It's their trade. Why would they threaten it? it? It makes no sense. When you understand that, you can see right through this. But, but they know when they're writing this, so many more people will not see through it. I want to point out that the U.S. ruling class was, was divided on how to deal with Taiwan after um, 1949. And the consensus was not reached until the Korean War broke out. And um, MacArthur pointed out that the um, that Taiwan was nearest of all places to both Okinawa and the Philippines, which are under U.S. control. Which means they saw Taiwan as nothing but the perfect, you know, natural aircraft carrier that can't be sunk. So MacArthur um, argued that if Taiwan were lost to the communists, then it, it would create um, a comprehensive um, so-called defense network would be broken. But this defense network that the U.S. speaks of is really an aggression network. And I also want to point out, because I um, I feel like we don't have too much time left, that um, the first country to ever attack Taiwan with a warship was the U.S. in 1867. And the country that supported Japan in invading Taiwan during the Mudan incident was the United States in 1874. The country that sold weapons to Japan during the first Sino-Japanese War, leading to China's defeat, forcing China to cede Taiwan to Japan, was the U.S. from 1894 to 1895. The country that actively pushes for Japanese containment of China and Taiwanese containment of mainland China is the United States, from the 19th century until today. So can we really say that the United States is our friend? I mean, we're being used to serve U.S. imperialist interests, but they're still there. But they're making us pay for just pay so much money for weapons that aren't even effective in um, protecting ourselves if war broke out with the mainland. And, um, you know, some quote Tsai Ing-wen from that interview she did, I believe, with CNN a few years back, that said, in an event of war with mainland China, Taiwan can defend itself from the first wave, after which the international community will join in. But this cannot be further from the truth because nowhere in the Taiwan Relations Act does the U.S. state its obligation to defend Taiwan in the event of war. It simply states that efforts to determine Taiwan's status by non-peaceful means are matters of grave concern. Matters of grave concern can just mean, you know, um, Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden going on TV making a stern comment. And the U.S. lawmakers are keenly aware of this lack of commitment because um, former Illinois Senator um, Charles Percy proposed changing the words grave concern in, in the act to security interest. But this was vetoed because it would commit the U.S. to war with China should cross-strait antagonisms intensify. So, And the senior Pentagon official Edward Ross at the time said, as the lone superpower, our interests are plentiful and our attention short. We cannot help defend you if you cannot defend yourself. So the U.S. has not just recently shown signs that it's not going to come in and defend Taiwan should war break out. It's shown this this whole time. It's also shown throughout um, over the course of um, you know the last century, more than that, that it does not care about the people in Taiwan. It doesn't. It, the United States isn't our friend. It's the friend of um, certain um, beneficiaries of like. Of this sort of arrangement, you know, the small segments of the ruling elite, but nobody else in Taiwan. Absolutely. And just think about it. The whole reason that they're in this situation in the first place is because the U.S. Uh, sold them out to, to reestablish ties with, with the mainland. The U.S. wanted to, to use those, those new reestablished ties to reassert itself over China. When that didn't work, they went back to Taiwan as as their last card in their hand and and now you know you see the whole process start over and they're 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 right back to using taiwan as a battering ram against the mainland it, it's very sad it's sad to see and this is why they pick young people because older people wouldn't fall for this this is why they this is why they pick young people here in thailand and in neighboring countries they're the only ones that will buy into this 
When in reality, if you just take a few minutes and think, you use logic and reason, you will see that it is a formula to burn your country to the ground. And if you're in Taiwan, to destroy your home. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, it will be, just like you said, it will be reunified one way or the other. Just, mm. just pick which way you want to, to do it, peacefully or as a, a, in violence as a battering ram for the U.S. who is simply using you and has used you throughout history. Peacefully with dignity. That's what people exactly. don't get. Peaceful reunification is the dignified way of reunification. And it's the, it's the form of reunification where both sides can sit down and talk conditions. Mm. Forceful reunification and all of that goes away. And um, it's it's interesting how you mentioned the youth because um one of my one of my uncles, um he was very pro DPP in the 1980s when it was unpopular to be um pro DPP. I mean even in 2000 when the first DPP leader was elected, he had to promise that he is not going to make moves towards independence because back then, Taiwan separatism was still seen as this sort of um this sort of movement of destabilization by much of the population in Taiwan. So you can see how um. How easily the youth can be manipulated just in a matter of like 20 years. Now, that same uncle nowadays, he's one of my most um anti-DPP relatives I have in Taiwan because he's seen he's seen how um the DPP's um sold you know sold people like him out. He's seen how it's been a bunch of empty promises, and he sees, hmm. They don't have much to show for themselves except they were bringing us closer to the brink of war. And he says, you know, his parents, so my grandparents, his his parents and his grandparents have experienced war, you know, World War II. And it's not something that he wishes to experience or for his um his children or grandchildren to have to go through. Mm. And um it's go having gone through seen seen all of those own trials and tribulations of um you know, Taiwan's political and economic development, you gain more of an insight. But this sort of insight is one that um, the youth lack, especially when it's very easy for um, for these NGOs to kind of tell the youth who naturally want to rebel against their parents that, you know, hey, everything, everything they're saying is wrong. You are you are more advanced than them. You are you are more enlightened. You got to fight for the future. And one day they will see that you're right. You know, that sort of messaging, tried and true. So, I mean, OK, maybe this will be the last question, because uh, I think uh, when Nancy Pelosi was very ambiguous about her trip, whether she really landed in Taipei, the whole world was watching her flight and watching what the PLA, the Chinese military, will do. And everybody was kind of th like th thought um, there will be some war, there some some attacks from the PLA, but then she landed peacefully. And a lot of people I know within China and outside of China are kind of disappointed that nothing happened. Uh, they're disappointed that they just let Nancy Pelosi landed in Taipei safely and had this tour in Taiwan. So, I mean, a number of people were disappointed, but what's your guys' thoughts on this? Do you think this is like a better way to deal with this or what's the ideal way that you think is the, to deal with this situation? It's only been one day, so I mean, I feel like I, we shouldn't really, I shouldn't really comment and say and act like I know what's going on behind the scenes. But the way I see it is um, if, mainland China carried out the military drills that it's doing around the island without Nancy Pelosi's visit, then it would be even easier for the international media to, to spin it as a random act of aggression. But when, um, when the whole world was led to believe that Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan would result in World War III, and all that resulted so far was this sort of military drill, then it's kind of, the U.S. kind of gave the um, PLA, the justification for carrying it out while actually in a way saving face. Now, if the US, I mean, if the PLA did, you know, act more aggressively towards Nancy Pelosi, it would have been very easy for um, the US media to um, portray her as this freedom fighting hero. And that's what she wants to do this whole time. And why are we going to, um, why, should, why should we hand her that 
easy victory, and it would help her with her party's re-election in the upcoming um, midterm. So I think the way that China handled the situation is a lot more intelligent than um, and that than people think. And it's I do not think it's an act of cowardice. Quite frankly, I think it was a very smart move. Mm. I, I I agree with that, and I I, I would say again. For, for China, I don't think anyone could disagree that peaceful reunification with dignity, that, that is the best of all options. And uh, it is a long-term goal. It is something that requires patience. And the, the easy thing to do is to try to save face and lash out. And, but this is, not, this is not how China operates. This is not how a lot of countries operate. They're looking at long-term interests and they'll they'll even trade that they'll trade off short term face saving for these long term interests and and the peaceful reunification of Taiwan. It's just a matter of time if you look at the the economy of Taiwan, how it is into, already integrated with the mainland uh, in so many ways. Uh, and and as the U.S. pulls the the rug out from under Taiwan in terms of chip manufacturing, that that relationship with the mainland will become even more important. China can see this. That's the long game. They don't they don't need to. They don't need to fire a single shot. They, they can do this. But what the U.S. is trying to do, and this isn't the last provocation, they are going to continue trying to provoke China to get them to act in a way that will spoil peaceful reunification and possibly give the United States a, a opportunity before that overall window of opportunity closes and, and, and China surpasses the U.S. irreversibly to, uh, to get the war that they want, limited conventional conflict that they think will cripple the Chinese economy and allow them to reassert themselves as, as the you know global hegemon. This is this is the plan. It's not that it's a good plan, but that is their plan that they they wrote. Uh, the Rand Corporation has a whole paper out on that. Uh, and 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 you we saw the US do the same thing to to Russia. And we saw how patient Russia was until they weren't. I I think China will maintain its patience for as long as absolutely necessary until it's impossible. It will have to be impossible. And by that time, the world will agree that it was the U.S. that provoked any, any conflict that erupts. I think um, these recent events show us that so-called Taiwan separatism is not true independence, but it further it, it further um, embroils Taiwan into um, serving U.S. imperialist interests. I believe um, I believe independence means independence from, true independence means independence from this sort of hegemonic, unequal relationship where you don't even have dignity as a human being. And I do not think, and I think this sort of independence can only be achieved through peaceful reunification with the rest of China, where we are equal citizens, with equal rights, and we actually have our voices heard as equal citizens and not subjects of empire. Well said. Very well said. And thank you guys so much. It's uh, such a... I wish this could go longer, but I'm not sure how the attention span of our viewers. So maybe we can do another talk uh, soon as the whole situation develop. And I think it's pretty clear as we saw Despite China send serious warnings, this is the red line that no one should cross, but the United States cross it anyway. It pretty much shows that uh, we are probably entering a new chapter, a new phase of the deterioration of the China-US relations, probably a new world order as well. So let's wait and see what's going to happen next. So see you guys next time. <laughs>